Good morning, friends. Um, it is after 6 a.m. I slept in a little bit, apparently. It's about 59 degrees, hence the long sleeves. And we are going to do another garden tour. Um, I'm gonna start with the cucumbers. Um, they are going everywhere. I have tried to grow cucumbers for years and years and never got enough for all of our family's pickling needs. We eat a lot of pickles. And last year was the first year I put them on a trellis and they did amazing. So of course I did it again and you can see how they're just almost meeting at the top. Now, even with one of my dogs loves to come down here and pick her own cucumbers, even with her tearing them down um, last week, they have really come back very nice. So here you can see where she damaged them. And some of this is from cucumber beetles. And you can see one right there. That was a cucumber beetle some damage is from the cucumber beetles and some is from blight but i don't worry too much about it because the top this groweth is still healthy and producing it's fairly natural for the older part of your plant to start dying out a little bit as the plant matures um, and anytime you have an injured plant like what my dog did to these you're definitely going to have a little more, um, they're going to be a little more susceptible to blight and disease. And I'm going to show you some of the cucumbers that are ready to pick. Okay, so here I have two different cucumbers that I picked. Um, this one, we're going to eat fresh as a cucumber because it got too big. And this one is the perfect size for pickling. So if you're struggling with your pickles turning out mushy when you can them, try picking them much smaller, like while they are still wrinkly. Um, and I, I'll pick them even smaller than this because they stay much more crisp in, I spied another one that's perfect for pickling. And then when you, um, my dog spied me and I haven't let them out yet. So when I collect pickles, I rarely, when I collect cucumbers for pickling, I rarely get enough in one day. So I just put them in a shopping bag and store them in the crisper drawer of my refrigerator until I have enough to fill one, like seven quarts to fill a canner of pickles. I see another one that I've missed. So we're gonna eat some cucumber salad today too. There's another big fat one that I missed. When um, your, my cucumbers are in the stage where they're at now, I have to pick them morning and evening. Um, I don't think because they, I don't think it's because they, you know, ripen that fast. I think it's more because I miss so many of them. They're just hard to see. So one of the questions I get is, have to put this line up there where it belongs. Um, when cucumbers get bitter, it's usually because it's been hot and dry um, and you've let them get too big. So if your cucumbers are tasting bitter, you can still can them. Um, you can pickle them. The bitterness does go away when you pickle them, um, but try picking them younger and also trying to, yeah, picking them younger and maybe watering them. Um, but yeah, those are the reasons that cucumbers will taste bitter is when it's hot and dry. So last week, oh, it's just such a beautiful morning. Last week I was whining a little bit because I was afraid that my tomatoes we're just not gonna turn orange. I was impatient is what it was. And then I found, found that beautiful red tomato down there. I spied it 
<laughs> and I actually think that one's ready for picking. My tomatoes are just beautiful. I have a couple more down here that are turning orange. I don't know if you can see them. There's also some blight on this plant here. Um, I really do need to spray them again. Here you can see where the blight is progressing. Um, so I'm going to have to get some peroxide and I will put the screenshot of the peroxide ratio I use. I'll add that. But the peroxide ratio, the peroxide spray will keep the blight from progressing. It will not um, kill the blight altogether, but it'll just keep it from spreading. Well, tomatoes are the thing that I, if I could only garden one thing, that's what I would garden because my family uses a lot of tomato products over a year. I use the tomatoes to can pasta sauce and I do a chili base, we do salsa, um, we do a, uh, tomato juice. So we use a lot of tomato products. First thing I'll can when I get enough tomatoes is salsa because salsa is time consuming, it takes a lot of chopping. And if I don't do it in the beginning while I'm still fresh, beginning of the season, um, I usually push it off because later in the fall, I'm so done with canning, so sick and tired of canning, that I tend to be like, oh, we can just buy salsa, it's not that expensive. But then my family's like, mom, this salsa's not good, where's your salsa? And then I'll regret that I didn't can salsa. My little grape and cherry tomatoes are ready as well. So I'm gonna pick a bunch of these and these I will dehydrate. Um, and we will use them in the winter that way. I'll probably put them on breads, use them on pizza, things like that. One of the questions was if I prune pepper plants, and no, I have never pruned my pepper plants, although pruned pepper plants have happened in my garden um, because they break so easily. Last year, I actually staked my pepper plants with the tomatoes and it worked very well um, just because they tend to be a little fragile once they're bearing fruit. Um, and here, well, that one doesn't have any. Here you can see how loaded with peppers they are. That's a yellow one. Here is a green one right down in there. And I should probably harvest some of those and put them in the freezer um, so that they're ready when I'm ready to make um, pasta sauce. But when I make salsa, I will want fresh peppers. So you don't really have to harvest them at any certain time. Um, you can just let them hang and they'll be fine. And my um, onions are all falling down. And that was another question is how to know when to harvest onions or potatoes. So the onions, I don't worry about. They can just stay right here in the soil. You can see how the white ones are, have not fallen down yet. So those will be fine just to stay. The purple ones have all fallen down. So those are perfectly mature and I would just leave them. I'm not gonna harvest them for a good long time because I'm not ready to store them yet. These are really long here. I have all winter to go down in my cold room and get onions. I would much rather walk to the garden to get an onion. So that's one of the reasons that they'll just stay. There's no need to harvest them yet. The only thing would be if we would get lots and lots of rain, they could rot in the soil but that rarely happens here in the late summer. We actually are hurting for rain right now. We haven't had rain in two weeks. And so I've been watering. I watered my tomatoes. I just laid the drip hose down and watered them because they're loaded with fruit and I need every tomato I can get. 
and we probably won't need to mow the yard this week because it is it's turning brown in places and if you've listened to some of my other garden tours you know that that's kind of how i gauge if it's time to water my garden especially when everything's so heavily covered with grass cuttings i can't exactly tell how dry the soil is so and i don't want to disturb everything too much so if the grass starts turning brown and we don't mold it's usually a sign that i need to water my heavy producing crops like the tomatoes that's i pay a lot of attention attention to them because i don't want to have to buy tomatoes for canning so the potatoes right here they are still hanging on i have a feeling this dry spell that we're having is going to have them dying back really fast this row here is my red norlands which are the short season and we have been eating from that row but here again we usually don't harvest our potatoes until well into the fall um we let them cure in the ground and my only goal is to make sure i dig them before the ground freezes so we'll leave the potatoes until probably late september early october last year i remember digging them in october and if if we get a spell where we don't have much other canning to do i might you know harvest them but like i said i would much rather go to the garden for veggies i have all winter to get veggies from cold storage we have been eating red raspberries um, these are ever bears, so we don't have a lot of fruit in the summer, like just enough to, for fresh eating. Um, but they are, they're about to really give us a lot of fruit. You can see their, their main harvest is hanging on and that they will produce until frost kills them. Here's the green beans that I planted a couple weeks ago. I think it's been about two weeks now, a little over two weeks. And we have put compost on the garden here because this is where the peas were. And then we covered it all with some grass clippings to keep the weeds down. And one of the questions I got was, one of the questions was how to keep the weeds down on your row when you use grass clippings. So I will probably, if there's a lot of weed pressure on the green bean rows, I will probably pile grass clippings up close to the green beans, much closer than I have now. The only reason I left so much space is because the green beans were real tiny. Um, but I was in a hurry to get the soil covered and to put compost down because there was no rain in the forecast and I wanted to cover that soil to trap the moisture. Um, so I will probably end up piling grass clippings up closer to the stems of the green beans once they are taller, um, just to prevent weeds from growing on the row. So I'm gonna show you something that I'm experimenting with. Um, I'm experimenting with saving seeds. And what I did with my peas instead of letting them dry on the stalk, because I don't have room to let my peas hang and dry on the stalk to collect the seeds because I needed to put green beans in where the peas were. So instead of letting them dry on the stalk, I harvested them just like I would for eating and I shelled the peas and put them on a paper plate and let them dry. And then I planted them and I'm gonna show you what I found when I dug them up last night. There's one. See, it actually worked. That pea has germinated. I'm so excited. So these peas were not dried on the stalk. 
They were dried in the sh um they were dried on my cupboard. And it looks like it worked. We are definitely going to have peas growing here. So here is my conclusion with why one would dry the peas on the stalk. Um, the benefit with drying them on the stalk is that each pea seed would be fully mature. Like when I harvested them, like I would for fresh eating, the peas that were not quite mature, those are the ones that got moldy before they were completely dry. So that would be one benefit of drying them on the stalk would be you would have all mature peas and they would not um, get moldy. They would be dry easier. Um, but yeah, I planted them down there in a little patch just because I was impatient to see if it would work. Because if it does, that's a game changer for me because I can harvest things like I would for eating and then save the best ones for seed instead of letting them take up space in my garden for the rest of the summer, which I don't have. And I think if I'm correct in every garden tour that I've done so far, I have mentioned that I don't have enough space, which brings me to the conclusion that my garden probably needs to be bigger. And I probably need to start talking to my husband about, we need to make the garden bigger because it usually takes him a little while to agree that I need a bigger garden because he walked with me through those years of little ones where I struggled and struggled to keep up with the garden. Um, so he's always trying to save me from myself and save me from getting back to that where I have too much garden and not enough time. So the problem now isn't time, it's I have too many things I want to grow and not enough garden. And yes, I watered the pea seeds yesterday. Actually, I watered them over the weekend and then I watered them yesterday again um, while we wait on rain. So this is the part of the garden that's an actual jungle. And you see, I've got my very first sunflower up there and the sweet corn is pollinating. Now, the thing about sweet corn is I've driven by gardens where they have one row of sweet corn that's not going to work very well. You're not gonna get very good pollination because sweet corn, like the pollen falls from the tassels onto the silk of the sweet corn, but it doesn't just fall straight down on the silk of its own stalk. It goes all over. So you'll have much better pollination if you don't want to plant a whole bunch of sweet corn, just put it in a little square. Plant it in a little square so it's not just one single row. Like I have, I think, six rows deep and about 50 feet long. And that is going to pollinate very well because the pollen drifts, you know, with the wind. It rarely falls straight down. So it's going to get the pollen from the rows next to it and more than it'll get from the tassel just on its own stalk. We are going to have some beautiful ears of corn here in a couple weeks. It takes so long. When you see the tassels, you start thinking sweet corn, but it usually takes another month before you have sweet corn that you can eat. So somebody suggested that I show what is in my garden shed and I want you to know that I have not cleaned up at all in here so what you see is what you get and just know that I often send the kids to put things away here in the garden shed but really we just keep pots in here and over here go my garden tools Let's see if I can zoom out it's really just a big giant mess of garden things. Up there's my cedar. Man, but the cool story about this garden shed. Here is the kids' little garden. They have pumpkins, pumpkins blooming. 
And I think they have some cucumbers too. Yep, they've got some cucumbers growing too. Cows are down there. Anyway, I got distracted. What I was going to tell, tell you about the garden shed is that when we moved here, there was a big old dairy barn here. And, but when we moved here 23 years ago, the dairy barn was already beyond saving. Like it was already raining down through the roof, down through the second story and onto the main floor of the barn. <clears throat> So it was beyond saving, but it was beautiful. It was two stories and we used some of the old hay up there. We used that for gardening. Um, but inside on the second floor of the barn, on the inside, there was an old granary where they stored their grain. And we used the walls, some of the walls of that granary to build this garden shed. So that is what this garden shed is from. We used the doors, the hinges, um, literally my husband just took a chainsaw and cut squares out of the greenery walls because the boards were so dry and so old that it was impossible to take them off and put them back together. So we just cut squares out of the greenery walls. And back here you can see I store my um, tomato cages that I no longer use. I store them back here. So that is the story of my little garden shed. One of the questions that I got was how do I feel about using um, ground cover or plastic as a weed barrier? I personally really, really love to work with the soil. So when I have plastic or weed barrier, it kind of takes some of the joy out of gardening for me. However, I say that because right now I have children that can gather all the grass clippings I need and I use the grass clippings as a weed barrier. And But once my 14 year old son and my 12 year old daughter, you know, if they were not here to use the little Honda lawnmower and gather grass clippings for me, I probably would be looking at using some ground cover, like maybe for my tomatoes and peppers and sweet onions maybe, you know, things that really get a, you know, they stay in the garden for months and months and there's, it's hard to weed around them without damaging them. So I probably would be using some ground cover um, like that, just to make it easier for me. And definitely if my garden was much bigger, I also probably would have to use some just because I wouldn't have enough grass clippings to, um, you know, to cover everything all year, all season. The thing that always makes me think twice about using grass, uh, using ground cover, like um, landscape fabric or plastic is watering. Then I have to put, um, you know, trickle tape or I have to put that watering tape underneath to make sure that it gets enough water. And anytime that you're watering with well water or any kind of water, you have to, it's a whole new ball game of fertilizing and watching your pH levels and the nutrient levels of your plants because water dilutes some nutrients or may, you know, just because water carries minerals of its own, it can either dilute the minerals that are in your soil or it can bind to them and make some not as available as they need to be. So then you have to adjust your fertilizer. Anyway, that's why I say it's a whole new ball game when you start using landscape fabric or plastic because of watering. So that's what always makes me put all my efforts into covering the soil with organic matter as weed control because I don't want to mess with all of the issues that come with when you're watering with well water or city water or something like that. So one of the things that we've been struggling with is I have an underground rodent of some kind um, and I'm not quite sure what it is but I know it's not after my plants, it's not after the roots or the seeds, it's after grubs. And the way I know this is because 
he tends, it tends, this rodent tends to like best where I have put compost down. Um, and I know that grubs love compost better than they love bare soil. So where I put all my new strawberries in, I also put compost on there and he has uprooted most of my new strawberry plants. So Hadassah and I, the way we are battling this rodent is anywhere that we see where he's made new tunnels, we are stuffing dog hairs into these tunnels. And I haven't seen any new tunnels in a couple days. So I'm hoping that he officially has moved on. But that is the biggest battle right now. And the potato beetles. We're still picking off potato beetles. I did have a question on how to battle potato beetles. We just pick them off and feed them to the chickens. And hope for the best. Maybe we'll get a really, really harsh winter that will kill any grubs that are in the soil. But with harsh winters, you know, it's just not so pleasant, even though it kills all our bugs. Well, I think one more thing I'm going to show you, and that is some of my favorite garden tools. And then I'm going to have to wrap it up for this week. Okay, so first of all is this little weed digger. I always know where this is. I never misplace it because it's that important. I can weed big weeds even when the soil is dry and hard because I just dig down and lift them right up. And I'm gonna try and link these tools in the description um, if I have time. If I don't have time to find the links for all of them, um, this I think was called a dandelion digger and it's got these little forks right here and it lifts out even the biggest weeds in my garden. The next one is this stirrup hoe. And this is what the stirrup hoe looks like. It has a sharp edge and you just pull it. You can hoe going both ways and it just cuts those little seedlings right off. And I mostly use this right before I'm gonna put down um, some weed barrier just to make sure there's no live weeds trying to push up through the grass clippings. Um, so I just use this one mostly for that. And then the other tool, now these are just my top three favorites. The ones that I'm always, they rarely get put away. This is just a little hoe with a V on it. And I use this for making rows, like when I'm gonna plant seeds. And also like when I'm hoeing around um, my plants, I like this one because I don't damage the plants as much. I have more control over it because it's smaller. All right, I think that is going to be the end of this week's garden tour. Thank you so much for everybody that watches. I really appreciate the comments. And if you have ideas on things to talk about, things you want me to cover, please don't hesitate to put them in the comments. And as for now, it is time for me to go find that cow and get the milk for the day.